With the Crash Bandicoot franchise lying dormant for several years and finally making its triumphant return with the Insane Trilogy and Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled remakes, along with what feels like a new Crash game just over the horizon, I figure now is the perfect opportunity to bookend and celebrate Crash's first era, ready for what I hope is a thriving new chapter for our favourite Bandicoot moving forward. And given that I've played every single Crash Bandicoot game, it only makes sense to officially rank every single Crash Bandicoot level. A top 10 just isn't going to cover it, so get ready to rank a whopping 163 unique Crash Bandicoot levels from worst to best. Now quickly before we start, since this is such a big undertaking, let me quickly cover some of the rules and criteria for this ranking. First and most importantly, we will only be ranking unique levels throughout the franchise, so stages like the Lost City and Sunset Vista for example will be considered as a single spot on the list as they both feature the same design, enemies, hazards, music and just general gameplay feel. However, if a level of the same category drastically changes any of its core features, then it is eligible for its own spot on the list, but only if the differences are major. The colour of the sky is not enough to earn a new spot, because that's not important. What we're looking at is the core structure and themes of each location across the entire series. As for exclusions from this list, no race tracks from any of the racing games will be featured because there is enough of those for their own video, and no mini games from the various party titles will be featured either. We're focusing purely on the primary crash experience, which is linear platforming and collecting with some vehicles thrown in. Boss fights are also excluded from the list, unless the boss fights appear within the levels themselves. So while Papu Papu is not receiving an invitation, Cortex and Mecha Bandicoot are still included as a part of the Jungle Bungle map from Crash to Insanity. Of course, any levels not officially featured in the games will not be included. And finally, hub areas and any non-levels that aren't really anything, along with any transitional locations, will not be included either. It's a shame, I know, but as much as the Great Hall perfectly showcases the Crash Bandicoot gameplay we know and love, all of these criteria have been strictly enforced to keep this ranking as balanced and concise as possible. And just so we're clear, this is not about my personal favourites whatsoever. I've worked incredibly hard to keep things as unbiased and focused on the core qualities of each level as humanly possible. So with all of the rules out of the way, get ready to see every level from your favourite games, but also levels from some Crash games that most people have probably never even heard of. It's time for every Crash Bandicoot level ranked, so the only question remaining is... What is the absolute worst Crash Bandicoot level of the entire series? That title goes to number 163. Ghost Town from the Wrath of Cortex. It shouldn't be to anyone's surprise that this level is rock bottom, coming from one of the most polarizing entries in the series, with fan opinions varying wildly. But regardless of how you personally feel, who thought this was acceptable? At first glance, we're just riding around in minecarts having a cute little race against Crunch Bandicoot, who is the main antagonist of the entire game so it's already a bit strange. But the simple fact that you can actually beat this level and win the gem without even touching the controller and doing nothing is what makes it the absolute worst. Why waste effort trying to avoid hazards and taking different paths when you can just sit and watch the game play with itself? 
Sure, there may exist much more annoying, frustrating, and less appealing levels, but next to this, they are all superior for even attempting to be an actual level. And let's not forget, Ghost Town is in the secret warp room of this game, meaning you've got to work extra hard to even unlock this to begin with, which makes it an even bigger kick in the balls, a theme that continues on with level 162. Force of Nature, another Wrath of Cortex level. This game features the largest number of unique levels for the series, so we're only just getting started here. Force of Nature is the final level unlocked in this game, and if you thought earning 10 time relics for Ghost Town was bad, have fun earning 25 for this abysmal mess! Playing as Coco on her snowboard, this is a miserable experience. There is nothing interesting with the gameplay or level structure. In fact, the level looks like an unfinished prototype if I'm being honest, and the camera is always at such an odd angle that it's consistently awkward trying to navigate the level correctly. It's not fun, and as the final level of a game, it's one of the worst levels I've ever seen. Up next, we've got an area from Mind Over Mutant on the Nintendo DS. Engine Labs. Are you kidding me? Supposed to be named after Engine, of course, who is one of my favourite characters. And if this woeful misspelling wasn't enough reason for this to appear so low, then maybe the dull grey colour palette or the tedious magnet puzzles will do it. This is already an incredibly uninteresting game to play through, but this area is just something else I can't even put it into words. Then they give you what is easily the worst titan or mutant out of all of these games, the Psycho Mandrake. It's completely worthless, it can't do anything. And the boss fight here only complements the disappointment you'll find inside Engine Labs. Bloody Engine Labs, how did they fuck that up? Staying with Mind Over Mutant, the real game this time, Evil Public School is the major area that a large majority of the game's narrative revolves around. We go through so many locations prior to getting here just looking for a way in, spend about two minutes inside doing this lame chase sequence and a god-awful defense mission, watch Crash and Aku Aku kiss, and then leave. That's it. What was the point of all of this? Why ruin the mystique of an amazing area from a previous game for absolutely no good reason? It's no wonder Mind Over Mutant was the final Crash game for almost a decade when this is the level of quality it was putting forward. Back over on the DS version, we've got Crystal Mountain. God, this is bad. Our ride for this portion of the game is the Electric, another really poor excuse of a Titan. This area maybe wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for all of the lightning that comes down without warning and burns your ass. It's everywhere. There is a lightning storm going on and all Crash can do is get obliterated and run over by a herd of bulls. Over and over and over again. It quickly grows far beyond frustrating to just plain tedious and mind-numbing in a matter of minutes. Mind-numbing? Tedious? That's exactly what Wrath of Cortex is like, using terrible vehicles over and over and over again. But none are more infamous than Smokey and the Bandicoot. I don't think it's physically possible for someone to enjoy this disaster unless they're the totally clueless moron 10-year-old square-eyed Jack. The jeep floats all over the place while you try desperately not to fall into pits or get stuck behind the other drivers. And this is such a temperamental level too. Sometimes you can go through here and win first try, but other times you get stuck for what feels like forever grappling with the controller just trying to get past this so that you can reach the next super amazing level in this game. The fucking underwater levels. Seashell shenanigans and Coral Canyon. 
Oh boy, let's do this shit. There are only two levels in Wrath of Cortex that are not unique, so at least I won't have to talk about either of these again. But I mean, what can even be said? The big issue with both of these is that they're far too long with no decent structure at all, and while the calming ocean music could be considered relaxing, these levels sure like to boil your blood to a point of spontaneous combustion for how frustrating it is to get through here. For me, it's the lack of visibility. Hazards can just fly in from out of nowhere and kill you. Even the submarine doesn't help you out to the point where I actually think Crash on his own is stronger than this giant yellow tumour. Wow, I hate this. Okay, more Wrath of Cortex apparently. This time we have Ice Station Bandicoot, which again, you need to put in extra effort to unlock. Wanna know what this one is like? Well, it's a claustrophobic bootleg of Rings of Power, that flying level from Crash 3 Warped. Which, I must say, was a bad level by that game's standards. So how do you think this one makes me feel? It sucks, moving on. Up next is Adult Edumacation from Crash of the Titans. This is where we first encounter the E-Electric Titan. Glad to see that he's back so soon. Back just in time to wait around on platforms for all of this map. But it's not long before a boss encounter against Uka Uka takes place. The dude gets jacked and sends out so many enemies for us to mow through. It's such a poor excuse for a boss. It seems simple at first once you gain control over Uka and start smashing shit, but the numbers game quickly takes over to a state of not even being possible to complete half the time. This is another temperamental level like Smokey and the Bandicoot, where it can take anywhere from 3 minutes to 30 minutes to complete. Oh, it's a bad treat alright. Now let's switch gears for a moment and check out Crash Twin Sanity on mobile. Since this game is so basic and only features two different level themes, which are literally just palette swaps, this game will only represent a single spot on the list. But as you can see, this is all about the Crash and Cortex co-op levels from the actual Crash to Insanity. It's an incredibly short game and the levels are essentially all the same thing, but for what it is and considering the platform it's on, I do think it's kinda neat. If we'd seen a little more from this, it might not have appeared in the bottom 10 games, but unfortunately, we just have to look at everything on a grand scale here. But with all of that said, it is the best of the 10 worst Crash Bandicoot levels. And yeah, <laughs> we've barely even scratched the surface on this list. So I'd suggest going and grabbing some snacks right now because we're going to be here for a while. Staying with Crash to Insanity, in at 153 is the Iceberg Laboratory. Now, just to clarify, while this and some of the other locations in this game do resemble a hub area or non-level in a lot of cases, the game itself does treat them equally with the other eligible levels, as they each have their own collectible items. So, these will all be included on the list. Saying that, there really isn't much to discuss about them though, especially the Iceberg Lab. It's got a really cool design for sure, but all you really have to do here is complete these fairly basic puzzles and collect gems scattered across the small map. It might not be as bad as some of the levels still to come, but it's just such a weak location where gameplay is concerned that it wouldn't be right to place it any higher. It's the same story for Twin Sanity Island. I bloody love this place just for the design alone, but it's by no means good in the grand scheme of things. It's just the same concept as Iceberg Lab, with some much more difficult gem puzzles and a neat bit of music to go along with it. The design of levels is a major factor we're looking at, and this one certainly ticks the boxes in that aspect, but it's just a shame it was wasted with virtually no gameplay to offer. 
And back to Mind Over Mutant on DS with the final area of that game, the Spacehead. These are just generic sci-fi laboratory levels, but with one crucial detail. Cortex Butt Switches. Yes, you heard me correctly. Cortex Butt Switches. If you give him a cheeky spank on the bum, he'll make platforms appear, and if you really pound on that thing, you get extended time to make the jumps. But watch out, sometimes they launch airborne flaming shits at you, so please, be careful. It might just be my immature sense of humour, but getting to slap that ass constantly makes these boring, uneventful levels so much more tolerable. <laughs> Cortex butt switches. <laughs> Slap that ass, boy. <laughs> Next up, we have Crash of the Titans on Game Boy Advance. Now, I'm going to level with you here. This is a bad game, and the levels themselves have zero variety, aside from the background. Gameplay stays the same, most of the Titans stay the same through each area, and even the boss fights are all generally the same idea. There is not a single thing unique about any of these, but, given the game is split up into five different areas, let's go through each one and just get all of these out of the way right now. I might even be able to bear a couple sentences of critique along the way. First is Insanity Island, the middle island. It starts off with cliffs, waiting around for platforms, and then a laboratory gauntlet with some serious roadblock moments that are really unfun. The only enjoyment comes from jacking Engine and riding him around. Okay, next level. At 149, we've got the Floating Fortress, which includes more lab gauntlets and waiting on platforms. What can I say here? The final fight against Cortex and all of the previous bosses in the game is slightly hilarious, but it's just not good. Prior to this is Entrapment Island. Great name, great gimmick climbing up a giant tree. Unfortunately, inside the tree and the fight with Nina Cortex isn't worth writing home about. Little bitch refuses to die, which really irks me. Then we have Tiki Island to look at, which is the second area. It's got a beach and an icy cavern. And that's about it. Man. Almost got a full sentence out of this one. That's how you know the quality is improving. And finally, we've got Wampa Island, which ironically, maybe, is the start of this game. The structure of these levels aren't quite as annoying and convoluted as they would end up being later on in the game, but still, there is nothing here to comment on. It's all the same shit on repeat. And just like that, Titans on GBA is knocked out with a single devastating hit. So now we can move on to a real Game Boy Advance game with Crash Bandicoot 2 Entranced. While this game is leagues above Crash of the Titans, Coco's run from the sun levels certainly don't represent that. They're just not interesting. It's easy to miss items due to the poor depth perception, and unlike most chase levels in the franchise, this might be the only one where you can't actually see what's chasing you. The entire thing is lifeless, just like staring off into the void of space. Furthermore, the jetpack levels in Crash Bandicoot XS, or the huge adventure if you'd prefer, are also just below average trash. All you do is move forward, trying to avoid all the stuff flying at you, then hold the button to very slowly destroy Cortex's blimps along the way. For a handheld, it's a fine distraction, but that's nothing to be proud of. Uh, I've got that sinking feeling that these levels are not going to improve anytime soon. Welcome back to the Wrath of Cortex for level 143, another flying stage. This one is a bit different though, with the dragonfly designed plane, and it controls like nothing else in the series, which ultimately makes this level more of a chore than it really needs to be. 
I like this volcanic island location, but having to loop it several times just to take out every target, while that hideous music is buzzing your ears off, I have played worse, but I have definitely played better. Back with Titans now, a lot of the levels in this game are essentially just a bunch of forced roadblocks which require punching out waves of enemies before you can continue. But Weapons of Mass Construction continuously forces Crash off of whatever Titan he's commanding into a handicap against the next batch of enemies. It's frustrating and cheap, adding challenge by cutting your balls off instead of forcing you to grow them. Yet, before you know it, it's all over! Like, what? Thankfully, the DS version of this game isn't totally obsessed with forcing you to stop and fight, and it's a lot better than the GBA version. But while that is the case, the final stage of the DS game isn't the best example of that. Inside of the Cortex bot, all we need to do is make our way through the 3D and side-scrolling segments as Crash, play a quick section as Nina, and finally, face off against Cortex in this lame final fight. And like most of the bosses this low down the list, all you really do is attack without any significant pattern or challenge. This is surprisingly a solid game, but it falls off a cliff towards the end if you haven't jumped off it first. Now we've got Crash 3 Warped, entering the list fairly early on with Egapus Rex. This is a secret level in the game, thankfully not unlocked by collecting relics, but instead found when Crash takes the gem route in Dynomite and decides to jump into a pterodactyl. Yes, you do that and then you find the level. What kind of fucked up cryptic bullshit is that? But as for the level itself, it's a very basic side-scrolling stage riding on the baby dino to victory. Not much to be said on this one, it's an oddity for sure. I always found it strange how Crash was designed to take advantage of the third dimension, yet almost every game featured some kind of side-scrolling. Egopus Rex here being one of the dullest examples of that. And of course, a lot of the portable games were entirely side-scrolling, for obvious reasons, but it's still an interesting thought given the dimensions this franchise was supposed to be breaking. Womper Island here introduces Mind Over Mutant on DS and its boring gameplay pretty well. For one, this is the only area in the game to feature two different background images. Wow, that's a big leap in quality for this game, trust me. It does also help that the Spike Titan found in these levels is the second best of the entire game, but beyond that, there isn't much else to see here. Time for another level from Entranced on the GBA. Now we're taking a look at the wakeboarding stages. Jump off the ramps, smash crates, and avoid the shark. These levels are okay, but just okay. Much like the jetpack we saw earlier, for a handheld, it serves as a solid distraction. It looks and sounds good, sure, but I've personally got fonder memories with the Crash Bandicoot McDonald's game of the same stage, as the depth perception was a little better in that version, having an overhead view. How embarrassing. But if we're going to throw down over depth perception, look no further than Crash Bandicoot XN on mobile. Just take a look at this game. Look at how tiny everything is. You can't even see where you're going to land most of the time. Now, you're probably wondering, how is this higher on the list than any of the previous levels? I'll admit that, yes, these courses are far from special. But for a mobile game of this era, there is a lot of content here, and a lot of these stages offer some detailed areas to explore, all things considered of course. Since everything is just a palette swap again, everything here is only a single spot on the list. 
but it deserves this spot. It's an enjoyable game with some decent challenge and accurately portrays the Crash Bandicoot experience for mobile. And the fact that worse levels could come from much stronger games and stronger systems says a lot about the quality of this. So, I hope you can appreciate what we've got here. Proof that weak graphics and inferior ports can still stand tall next to stronger hardware if the gameplay is fun. XN may be minuscule, but it remains a strong entry for these lower positions. Back to the space head for the finale of Mind Over Mutant. As expected, the final level of the game is usually one of the weakest. We've got a circular hallway which leads to different rooms. Both of these have some rather uninteresting obstacles, and the third room has a boss fight against Cortex. This is not a good boss fight, even by Cortex fight standards. Quickly he turns into giant Cortex, in a diaper, what is it with these games? And before long, we're controlling him running around slamming and stomping enemies. He even burps and farts, how hilarious. Thankfully it's over with fairly quickly so we can get back to watching these dope animated cutscenes. The Blizzard of Claws from Crash of the Titans is up next. In case you didn't know, this is the level with Tiny Tiger doing his best Mike Tyson impression. What more do you need to know? Crash, I really am cross with you. I'm just trying to do my job and you go and cause all this chaos. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to eat your face. But before that, we've got a lava level, which actually wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for all of these damn Magmadons. They've got one of the most bullshit attacks, which is fun because they love to gang up on you. And then, of course, a terrible boss fight against Tiny Tyson that's just as anticlimactic as one of Cortex's smelly farts. Later on in Titans, the third to last level had some potential to be a neat stage, but just wasted it, like usual. War of the Worlds takes place in this elegant castle area, which is cool, but the level is literally just a hallway with a big room at the end. 90% of your time in this place is spent here just facing the same titans on what feels like an endless loop. It takes so long and when you're finally done, you walk another hallway and the level is over. Thankfully there is no tiny or cortex fight at the end, but that's still such a worthless experience so late into the game. Now we're back at Wrath of Cortex for yet another flying level, Crashteroids. This time we're up in space with Coco, taking out satellites while all of the minions dive bomb your ship. There's not much to say. Equally unexciting is Tornado Alley, another flying level. My god, what were they thinking here? It's only the second level of this game and we're darting around destroying these tornado machines to some serious country bumpkin music and that's it. I just want to know where all of these flying stages come from because they all suck. Crash 3 Warped, that's where they came from. Wrath of Cortex is just a copy and paste of this game, as you can see here with Rings of Power next to Ice Station Bandicoot. So, now we get to see the inspiration for that level. This is essentially a quick race through the rings, but we've actually got some space to manoeuvre and get speed this time around. Other than that though, it's still not great. And you know, we're still far away from things being great when the next level on our list is Avalanche. Jesus, this is something else, let me tell you. It starts off fine enough, frolicking through the snow with Coco, skidding around on ice and avoiding hazards, but then you're thrown onto her snowboard and expected to sled through all of the flag markers while there is a natural disaster happening right behind you. All to the tune of this super cheerful music. Yeah, 
that nice music really takes the edge off. It makes Death by Avalanche seem so much more comfortable. It might be a lot better than Force of Nature that we saw earlier, but there is only one level that is worse than Force of Nature, so that is not a compliment by any means. Similarly, Droid Void is another rough level to bear witness, but maybe it wouldn't be so low on the list if it wasn't for how sluggish Crash is on the monkey bars in this game. It's a total nightmare. And then you follow that up with this awkward mech suit dearly, it's not good at all. I can at least appreciate how dynamic the level is, going from the Sonic's ass gameplay into side-scrolling, back to Sonic's ass and back to side-scrolling. Crash is at his best when it's actually a 3D game, but he's also at his worst thrown into vehicles. Thankfully, Crate Balls of Fire was a little bit better, adding in a chase sequence and removing a lot of the monkey bar segments. But as a result, it is rather heavy with the mech suit instead, making it clunky to navigate. Now we have another mobile game, Crash Twin Sanity 3D. And yes, this is actually a 3D crash experience on mobile. It's amazing, actually. The game takes place across Insanity Island, the Iceberg Lab, and a dark cavern. Again, we're just counting all of these as one, but for a mobile game, this is incredibly fun and quite true to the formula of the series. Run forwards, smash boxes, and jump around a bit. We've even got the Roller Brawl gameplay, which is exactly the same thing as everything else, but it doesn't change the fact that this is still one of the more impressive Crash Bandicoot mobile games, and I'd have to encourage you to seek it out if you're a big fan of this series. Sure, it's mediocre, but it still trumps a lot of the other shit we've been swimming through so far. Before we move on from Twinsanity, though, let's take a look at Madame Amberley's Academy of Evil. While this is essentially nothing more than a courtyard with those same gem puzzles we've already discussed, the atmosphere and design of this location is an absolute classic for the series. It's so much more stylized than anything else in this game or most of the others. However, gameplay-wise, it is another very weak location, which is just a shame. Lots of untapped potential here that was later squandered away with Evil Public School in Mind Over Mutant. But the best of these base locations in Twinsanity has to be Insanity Island. It is split across three separate areas, again featuring those gem puzzles, but the first of these areas at the very start of the game gives you a lot of room to run around in and get familiar with the controls. I'd even go as far to say, this area showcases that the Crash formula could work well with a more traditional open collectathon approach similar to things like Spyro and Banjo-Kazooie. So, hopefully we'll get to see that someday. Now back to Mind Over Mutant with the Junkyard. It's a shame that such a neat idea for a level was, once again, wasted away to nothing more than a brief side-scrolling segment with a lackluster boss fight at the end that makes the entire location feel like padding to what could have been otherwise a much more sound experience. However, I do think we can all agree that this level does earn its time in the game for a single standout moment of the franchise. The introductory cutscene with Embryo. It's absolute magic. I created Slinkies! Stop playing with them because they're mine! At the end of the day, the level itself is fine, but it's seriously lacking in content. Let alone good content. It just needs something more. Throw in some more toxic waste hazards or something. Liven the place up a little. And just like that, the original Crash Bandicoot is finally in the race. I won't deny that I actually really like this level, the vibrant high contrast design and energetic music, but that does not mean it's good. The gameplay is weak, with only one type of hazard and absolutely nothing else going on. It's a straight line for God's sake, and that's literally all that can be said about it. 
The same statement can be applied to Mind Over Mutant on DS. What more can I really say about this game? Desert Wasteland, while still not good, is definitely the best thing this game has going for it. The layout of the levels is neat, with some interesting hazards, and the Titan for this area is also incredibly effective with its own cool design I wish we could have seen in the main games. But with that, this version of Mind Over Mutant is officially done for. Next to the Game Boy Advance version of Titans, it's absolutely one of the weakest entries in the entire series. Keeping with the theme of portable games, Huge Adventures Underwater levels are a decent adaptation of those from Crash 3 Warped. I actually like them, they did a good job here. It's hard to say that these are bad because they're really not, but they're also not good if you know what I mean. We're starting to enter the realm of just mediocre stuff. And besides, we all know Crash's true form was always platforming, such as these sewer stages from the same game. Of all the platforming stages from both Huge Adventure and Entranced, the sewer stages are the weakest of the pack, but still enjoyable. However, the big problem here is that the balance, pace and structure is really off for some reason. You get a bonus stage right at the very start of the level. What is that about? And while it is a portable system, we just don't get as much of the individual elements that made these levels so great on console. We're up to 119 now, and we're starting to get through these a bit. Here we have Tsunami, another Wrath of Cortex gem. I actually quite like the atmosphere in this stage. The rain is pouring down and the villagers are scrambling to get home before the giant tidal wave washes through. And of course, we've got Coco escaping on her hot pink scooter. It's a very short stage, and I'm pretty sure we spend more time in the bonus area than it actually takes to get through the rest of this, but thankfully the gem path takes you back around to platform above all of the devastation. That's a really cool idea. It's a damn shame we're playing as Coco though, because she just can't platform like Crash. But the idea is solid at least. It's a shame we couldn't have seen more of this concept within the main portion of the level. Now, you might remember at the top of this video, I mentioned that none of the racing games would be eligible to appear in these rankings. But it just so happens that there is one Crash Bandicoot racing game that actually featured a whole bunch of platforming gameplay. Yes, I'm talking about Crash Tag Team Racing. I hope you're buckled up for this. Yes, while this is primarily a racing game, the platforming worlds found here are equal to the similar style areas we've already seen from Crash to Insanity, so we're going to include them. Quick point of note before we get started though, some might argue that these areas are simply hub areas which are not being included. However, I'd argue that Von Clutch's motor world is the hub area to these various platforming locations and the entire game. So for that reason, the midway here is not eligible for a spot on the list which easily makes Astroland the worst area of this game. There just isn't much to say. The goal of all these stages was collecting dumb little cutscenes and accessing the various events, but Astro World has all of this split across three separate areas with a bunch of slow moving platforms in the middle to connect everything. It's tiresome, constantly waiting around in the same location, waiting to get anywhere while the bland visuals destroy your vision. And of course, everything you touch includes a horrifically forced Uranus joke. Because this place stinks. Thankfully, we're through the absolute worst of it by now. While we've still got a bit of a slog before the really good stuff starts to join the mix, the utterly horrendous stuff is behind us at this point. 
Though you wouldn't really know that by looking at H2O No from Wrath of Cortex. Oh no indeed. This level starts off with that dreaded underwater crap, but quickly transitions into a more traditional secret base level. It's like a mean prank followed with relief, and the level itself is a decent one with some fun hazards. While it is cliche to have an underwater secret lair, it will always be a fun location to explore. Now we've got another level from Crash of the Titans on DS, Cortex's Lair. We start off outside and work our way in through the standard hazards you expect to find in a place like this. Giant monsters, electric barricades, and boring, waiting around platform sections. Man, this franchise really grew a boner for just standing around in the later games. The design of this might not be super interesting, but the gameplay is fine. Just a very uneventful level to visit, which makes me sad seeing this so late into the game. Let's stay with Titans for a little while and check out Engine Stage. Following the awful weapons of mass construction we've already looked at, we're still forced into fighting hordes of Titans on repeat. Thankfully, we're not continuously forced into a handicap and it's over with relatively quickly. The actual fight against Engine though isn't much, just more waves of enemies as you'd expect. But damn is Engine annoying in this game. Just shut up! You don't even look like a bandicoot! What? Shh, it's okay. Now we've got another mobile game to take a look at that's actually something a bit different. Crash of the Titans. Okay, maybe it's not that different. Let me say though, this is a really fun game for what it is. The visuals are drop dead gorgeous, seriously, this manga style is phenomenal and the music is amazing. The gameplay however is just walking to the right and punching. Jumps happen automatically and that's about it, but as basic as this is, it's so satisfying to play through and a lot of fun, especially for a mobile game of this era. Now, I was debating whether or not all of these different backgrounds was enough to define separate entries on the list. So, considering they're all split across five distinct parts of the map that each have a different boss at the end, we'll count them each separately. But we're doing them all right now since they're all so similar. Up first is the fifth and final area of the game, the Laboratory. This late into the game, you're about sick of the formula and the final fight against Cortex is woefully easy. Being so late into the game, things are quite hectic, which is a double-edged sword, but it's just so fun punching stuff that you hardly notice. Same goes for the third area in the temple. These doom monkeys are so strong, it removes any amount of challenge from this location, but the mystical music is really nice to listen to. Prior to this in Area 2, the jungle, we get to use these bat enemies to fly over everything, which is actually a lot easier said than done, giving this game some difficulty it desperately needed. Also, you've got to love pixelated Nina Cortex in her spider bot at the end. Level Triple One is the forest map, which is the fourth area of the game. Please don't ask me to tell you the difference between a jungle and a forest. I don't know, okay? All I know is that the visuals and music are nicer here, and the fight against Tiny Tiger is better than his fight in the actual Crash of the Titans, which is hilarious. But everything else is mostly the same. And to end off this game, we're back at the beginning in Area 1. Taking place by the beach, the music in these levels is amazing and features some of the best design titans. There is even a wave surfing level. God, this game is way better than it has any right to be. Even though it's incredibly basic, I'd still suggest to give it a try sometime. But with all of that, Titans on Mobile is officially completed. Heading into Tyrannosaurus Rex now, back into tag team racing. 
but we're not here to race. We're here for the weird cutscenes and what's honestly a pretty cool location to explore with Crash. It fits the theme park gimmick perfectly. You can bounce around on geysers, climb glaciers in the Ice Age, and explore the various volcanoes. And even though this is from a game that released at the start of Crash's downtime as a franchise, the level still captures the world we know and love from its stronger years. Same goes for Engine Factory from the DS version of Titans. This is definitely an engine inspired level with missiles everywhere, pistons and gears. It's like I'm back in the space station from Crash 2 or the battleship in Twin Sanity. These green muscle titans are a bit shit though, I'm gonna be honest. It's like if the Mr. T version of Crunch got covered in green gunk. Probably the second worst titan in the game, which is a shame, as everything else here is fun to crash through. But most importantly, they spelled engine's name correctly. Thank you. The next level, Entrapment Temple, is another indoors course, which this game seems to have a lot of. It kind of reminds me of the Egyptian levels from Warped with its design. It is lacking some of the finer style points, but it still looks great. Now, unfortunately, this level introduces the worst titan of the game, which is the Rhino Roller. This thing is controlled by moving your stylus on the bottom screen, and it's a total nightmare. Thankfully, we have more room than normal to compensate, but I still think this is abysmal. Overall though, not too bad of a stage. There is clearly a lot of Egyptian inspiration throughout the series, as we can see here in Tomb Town back with Tag Team Racing. This place actually has some pretty neat architecture, interesting areas to find and complete, including a maze with breakaway floors and the gated hallways. But as I'm sure most of you are aware, this entire level is let down with the garbage music that plays in the background the entire time you're visiting. It is awful. Now that you know my pain, let's get far away from here. Minority Rapport, the second last level from Crash of the Titans, features all of these big cauldrons filled with lava. It's a cool visual for sure. It's also got some rope swings and a tube surfing segment. But at the very start, getting that shot of Cortex's Doominator robot really makes you feel like you're going somewhere, which is something the Crash games always executed well. Other than that though, there isn't much to discuss here. Dumb kid me was appalled to have to quit this game when I first played it because I just couldn't get through here without getting a game over. So it's kind of embarrassing seeing just how easy this map really is all these years later. And now we arrive at the last Crash Bandicoot mobile game known as Mutant Island. This game is without a doubt the most in-depth mobile adventure Crash has under his belt. We get to run through the levels, platforming and beating up on titans, but also completing puzzles, rescuing bandicoots and fighting these huge bosses. The game might not be as stylized or visually appealing as the titans mobile game we saw a moment ago, but this still looks great with a great sound and some fun gameplay. So of course, we're going to quickly run through each of the different level themes here, as they're mostly the same gameplay wise, but each still offer a unique experience. The castle maps are some of the most confusing and longer levels in the game, and they all have this organ music that gets really annoying after a while, but a lot of the puzzles and split paths here are interesting to navigate, for the most part, and battling Cortex's Doominator robot more than makes up for the lacklustre portions of this location. Next up is the fire levels. These feature a lot of samey platforming but are still fun, though it is let down by the amount of climbing where a single misstep can send you all the way back down. 
The boss at the end looks great and has some of the more enjoyable patterns you'll see here in comparison to some of the other fights. The general concept of these is the same every time. Wait around until you're given the cue to jump up onto them so you can climb around and tickle them with a feather. But thankfully, they each have some different attacks. The jungle boss, for example, has these vines that come down and choke crash. The rest of these levels are just bouncing around all over the place and climbing up trees to make your way through, but there is also a nighttime stage which is actually beautiful. And finally, the ice levels are a lot of fun too. Sliding around all over the place, karate chopping mutant penguins. The layout of these stages is easily the best out of all of these, with some more interesting alternate tracks. But really, that's all that can be said for Mutant Island. It is another simple mobile game, but it's definitely top of the pile for those titles. And with that, we've reached the top 100 Crash Bandicoot levels. That's right. We're not even halfway through yet. But I hope you're enjoying it so far. If you are enjoying it, then consider dropping a like and sharing the video, because that would really help me out. Okay, now that I've had a moment to regroup, let's take a look at number 100. The Ratsicle Prison from Crash Mind Over Mutant. This is actually a decent map with a lot of memorable sections. Surfing around on the water, climbing by the falling icicles, and climbing back out of the prison itself. And later on in the game we get to come back here and take on the Magmadon Champion, so a large chunk of the story actually takes place in this location. It can be a bit of work to get through as it's one of the bigger locations we visit, however that doesn't take away from the enjoyment. Speak of the devil, if you want to talk about lengthy levels, then Gold Rush is the place to look. As much as I personally can't stand this place, it's definitely not awful, I will say that. It's another very dynamic level to navigate, despite the actual course not being super interesting. We go from running through a dusty western town, to side-scrolling, playing a bonus round along the river, but then we've also got the return of these bastard monkey bars and whatever this is. Wow, this is terrible. But Gold Rush is a very mixed level. Thematically, it's an absolute winner, but some aspects are just a bit too generic and lacking much of any character. This next level is pretty standard stuff, not much to really go into. It's a simple run through the jungle ruins with some of the better titans from the game. It's also got some nice visual moments, but not really any major landmarks. I guess they called it a Zero's Journey because it's got zero talking points. But it's not bad, what can I really say? However, a stark contrast to that is Happily Ever Faster from Tag Team Racing. This level has all the talking points. It's oozing with personality, mocking all the classic fairy tale tropes across its kingdom and dark caves. There is actually quite a lot to this place, with plenty of hidden areas to frolic around in, all to that cheery Dreamtime music. And while this has nothing to do with its position in the rankings, I have to mention that this portion of the game also has some of the best racetracks as well. Much like the Academy of Evil, this heavily stylized location is incredibly memorable, despite its less interesting gameplay. And the final entry from Tag Team Racing, Mystery Island is number 96. I said it before on Tyrannosaurus Rex, but this is another location that still manages to capture that world we all loved exploring in Crash's peak period. Another great map with plenty of hidden areas and platform challenges in a very vertical level. It uses the space it has quite nicely and serves as yet another example that Crash can work in this open collectathon formula. Will we ever see it? I have no idea. But I do know that this is the last time we'll be seeing Tag Team Racing in today's video. Time to go back underground for toxic waste on super steroids. Boiler Room Doom from Twin Sanity. This level is a bit repetitive, but it is one of the few levels where Crash and Cortex have to work together. 
Cortex gets stuck in a pipe and Crash is all like, okay, let me send you through all of these pipes and shit. Have fun. And if it's not that, it's using him as a mallet to mash enemies into the floor or just fleeing him all over the place. The music here has an incredibly mysterious yet manic tone to it, like the level is teasing you the entire way through. And of course, we've got your standard dingo dial boss fight at the end of it all. Not his best, but still fun. While this level also contains Cortex's sloppy farts, this place is anything but that with a lot going on, which is great to see. Here we've got Wizards and Lizards, back again with Wrath of Cortex. As far as Crash Bandicoot chase levels go, this is easily one of the less interesting or satisfying to play through, but it's still okay. It is incredibly short, I think that might be the problem here. You get the bonus stage almost right away, do the chase, and that's pretty much it. By the standards of this game, it's pretty good, but only average at best next to everything else we've got to look at. Inspired by Wrath of Cortex, now we've got the Atlasphere levels from Entranced on Game Boy Advance. These play out in an isometric view which is neat, and one of the core reasons Entranced is such a strong crash game despite its limitations. It feels like 3D, even though the entire thing is 2D sprites. Not the easiest look to achieve. The Atlasphere stages themselves are also accurately portrayed here with some good areas for speed, a couple of blind spots here and there due to the perspective, but an overall well executed vehicle level. You can even do multiplayer with this. That's really cool. Insanity Highlands is another typical Titan stage. Nothing too spectacular, but nothing terrible either. We've got some wind mechanics happening here and a great selection of Titans to jack and control through all of the different combat areas. But the colours are all kind of dull. For a farming styled map, it certainly lacks the vibrant colours you'd expect from this theme. Similarly, Tiny's Excavation is another standard course. It takes place in this canyon amongst all sorts of different machinery, which makes for a great atmosphere. It's very rustic and dangerous looking, so it's actually a rare example of a level that feels dangerous to play. It does include one part where you need to wait around for platforms, but everything else is fast-paced combat against the more enjoyable enemies of the game. And now, yet another Titans level from the actual game this time and its grand finale. This also has some rather intimidating visual aspects to it. The face of the Dominator peers over you while this entire thing is suspended in the air. And then there is the giant walkway littered with enemies, which leads onto the fight against Nina. This is easily the best boss fight in the entire game. And to be clear, that's not a difficult title to earn, given some of the previous efforts we've already discussed, but it still does a good job at closing out the story here. God, what a terrible name for a level though. I swear they tried really hard to make the stage names as convoluted and unfunny as possible with this game. And this isn't even the worst of it. But from the very end of Titans, right back to the beginning. A new hop starts this thing off like any other Crash game. You wouldn't know this was actually a game about controlling giant monsters and fighting while you played through this. Unfortunately, since that is the game, this level is a bit lacklustre as there isn't much going on, but it does a tremendous job of that old idea of feeling like you're going somewhere. You actually get to see the bridge up above that you cross over later on in this level, once you've found the spike. I'd honestly never even noticed that until right now. If we had some more traditional gameplay here, this would have been a superb map to play through. Right after this, the second level in is much more focused on the core mechanics found in the game. We get introduced to the snipe and some of the minor levolution elements, followed with some platforming along the cliffside. Then later on in the game we get to Life's a Beach, where Engine has pulled some Planet of the Apes type shit. But otherwise, it's a nice looking place with a gorgeous cove and waterfall at the end, where we fight a bunch of titans. Seriously, I want to visit this place, it makes for such a great backdrop to the rest of the level.
And here is another amazing level with an amazing setting. Mount Grimly is filled with deep fog, ghostly titans, and traps that require time freezing to get by. Even from the outside, this place is freaky, but indoors, the visuals are so much more dark and twisted. There seems to be less of a focus on combat around here and more on these time freeze puzzles, but the battle at the end against the Yuktopus and all of the other titans gives the level a nice balance. And we can't forget the unique cutscenes for this level in the style of South Park. It's weird and so out of place, but such a wild inclusion that you can't help but laugh. Now finally, we've made it back to the original Crash Bandicoot here for an absolute classic. Hog Wild and Whole Hog, despite the stiff control, are easily some of the most fun levels from the first game. Charging through the village on this pig, bouncing tribal drums and avoiding all of the shield dudes who block the path, and it's got Crash's weird face that he makes. They even kept that in the Insane Trilogy, which is awesome to see. I don't know what it is about these stages, but they just feel really cheeky and almost adolescent or immature in a way. It's such a fun distraction from all of the more serious undertones found throughout the three islands here, so much so that even my second grade teacher come to school to tell us all about it. And that just goes to show the mainstream appeal of these stages. Insanity Jungle takes us through the various temples and caverns that block our path, opening with a super gnarly rail grind. It keeps the level feeling fresh and dynamic, with the constant changes from hard stone interiors and lush flora exteriors. The most noteworthy landmark, however, is taking control of this yellow dude who can help you cross the lava-covered ground late into the stage. And in classic Crash fashion, of course, there is a power crystal on the other side. And back in Mind Over Mutant, the Wasteland offers up some much more free-flowing and exciting gameplay compared to the rest of the game. We get to roll across the dunes of the desert, doing mad jumps and loops, but inside, you can find the Snipe Champion in the back of a cave. Exploring this place is like a roller coaster, and the music is kick-ass. I'm going to say it, somewhat of an underrated location in my opinion. It's always a blast coming through here, and it's definitely one of the highlights of the entire game. And now we find ourselves back at Crash 3 Warped with more of these bastard flying levels. Really though, these are the only truly good ones that the series ever saw, meaning they're also responsible for a lot of the shit we've already had to sift through in this video. Oh well, flying above a World War II battleground, taking out blimps and other aircraft, while avoiding all of the Red Barons trying to take you out, offers something a bit different to everything else here. And it's crazy to think that we've got two orange rats knocking out the entire Luftwaffe in this kid's platforming game. And hell, it's actually pretty fun. And on that note, we have reached the halfway point of this video. And yet we're only just starting to get a nibble on the good stuff. Wow. But let's all take a quick intermission for snacks and toilet breaks. If you happen to be watching this in a single sitting, first off, why? And secondly, if you are watching this in a single sitting, then now might be a good time to stand up and have a nice good stretch, you know, move the body a bit, just so that you can say you did that today. All right, enough time wasting. Sorry, I'm just so excited. Let's take a look at level number 81. Keeping on with Warped for another spot, the secret level known as Hot Cocoa. Rather than the typical jet ski level where we traverse the path from start to finish, here we're given a non-linear approach instead. It's quite unique, wouldn't you say? There really is no other level in this game that allows you to attack it from more than one angle. Now, it is an admitted downgrade as a result, but still worth taking a stab at. The big issue is a lack of interesting hazards or design for the actual course, so it can drone on a bit. But the map still deserves some recognition for trying something so drastically different to the format. Now we've got Operation Overboard from Crash of the Titans. This is a very short stage, but a very memorable one. 
We're introduced to the Scorparilla here, and once we gain control of the big fella, Crash moves through the interior caves to find the Sludge. Another great titan, though much like many of these assholes, let them gang up on you and you don't stand a chance. Some cool set pieces here, but it's just a shame the level is so brief. But luckily for us, it's followed by a lengthier sprint along the beach towards the boundaries of Engine's base. And once we break in, we get this cool arena setting with the Scorparilla for some great combat before making a cheeky entry through the back door. Now, the Arabian stages from Crash 3 are iconic for the franchise, of course, so it's a shame that the translation to Game Boy Advance didn't serve these levels too well. They are fun with great visuals and music, but thanks to the addition of the flying carpet sections, they're not the best of Crash's handheld adventures. Entranced is already a game with more vehicle stages than standard platforming, so to have a platforming stage overrun with this undesirable gameplay is disappointing. Still, these are good levels, though if this was based on my personal opinions, they would probably appear lower in the rankings. Alright, we haven't seen a Wrath of Cortex level in a long while now, so let's check out Medieval Madness. Of all the vehicle stages in this game, the atmosphere is possibly the most interesting and least intrusive. Or maybe that's just me. Is it up for debate? Please don't kill each other in the comments about this. But one of the things I enjoy about these courses though, is that each map has unique themes and structure. The weakest of the bunch we're looking at now includes a lot of hard sloped surfaces, split paths with dead ends, and narrow walkways to navigate. It's let down by expansive, unused areas, but the challenge from sneaking past nitro crates and henchmen is great at this point in the game. Wow, we haven't seen a stage that looked like this since Crash to Insanity on mobile way back at 154. Bandy Cooper's shoot sees Cortex fleeing from evil Crash, so preoccupied that we have to clear a path for him. I don't know why, but the mystique of this environment was always really solid, like a lot of the 10th dimension in this game. The crashed rocket ship in the background is a powerful feature that the level actually rotates around. Gameplay wise, it's fairly simple and mostly involves standing around waiting, but it still has its moments for sure, with a large array of hazards we don't see anywhere else in the game. Now we've got more Wrath of Cortex, of course we do! I mean, we only started this ranking looking at this game, so the fact we've still got plenty more to go is scary. Cortex Vortex, it's a pretty stock standard sci-fi level that looks incredibly complex, but is actually fairly easy. Some of the obstacles look really cool though, and when combined together, require some interesting manoeuvres to get by, if you don't have a couple of masks handy. But the sheer volume of nitro crates spammed through the level certainly drops it down a couple of notches. They even tried to duplicate the big nitro explosion finale from Crash 3, but it's so underwhelming it brings a tear to my eye. So let's check out Bug Light to show Wrath of Cortex how it's done. Now that's more like it. Even though this level takes place within the Egyptian theme, here we actually get to go outside of the tomb walls. Plus, it's the only level in Crash 3 that uses the Firefly gimmick, so it's worthy of its own spot on the list. And what better level theme for the gimmick? Raiding these tombs has never been more chilling in the pitch black, knowing that the light could run out at any moment. And generally speaking, the moody Egyptian landscape outside sets the sun just right on this journey to defeat Cortex. In my personal opinion, the Insane Trilogy version does lack some of the atmosphere, but it's still a favourite of mine. Alright, it's time we ended the run for another game. Crash of the Titans on DS has a lot of indoor levels, which limit the potential for imaginative design. So Wampa Jungle, one of the first areas we traverse, is simply just a really strong jungle level. 
I love that we can see the ocean peeking through the trees at certain points. Cliffs, temples, bridges, there are a lot of cliches to find here and while there is nothing super noteworthy going on, it's a really enjoyable level to run around in for what it is. And the final level we've got to look at from this game, again from the first area, is the first level, Wampa Village. Starting outside, walking through the various ruins on the outskirts of Wampa Jungle, we soon find Crash inside a really beautiful cave, with springs of water, deep dark pits, and more simple solid gameplay. I wish I had more to say, but both of these levels speak for themselves. As far as post Naughty Dog Crash games go, Titans on DS is easily one of the strongest efforts. It manages to escape many of the poorer decisions made within the main version of the game and feels a lot more like a happy medium between old and new. But that's not to say Titans didn't have its moments as well. The Emerald Pity begins with a totally rad surf down through the forest, but at the very end, Crash emerges into the destroyed wasteland remaining after deforestation. It's an incredible narrative that doesn't need to be explained to the player and serves as a stark contrast for this portion of the game. I can't do it justice, honestly. It's moments like this that make the Crash series what it is. And after not too long, we meet the Rhino Roller and get to roller coaster our way through all of this heavy machinery. These themes continue on into the following stage, which starts above this giant saw blade. But really quick, can we please talk about the name of this level? Don't eat the yellow brick load? I mean, that's the absolute worst level name I've ever heard, combining Wizard of Oz references with the reference to eating yellow snow. But it's just the fact that they use the word load that makes this feel so dirty. Why did they do that? Clapping Cortex's ass is fine by me, but this one just crosses the line. Anyway, moving on. Some of the bigger landmark moments of the level include platforming down the side of a waterfall and then absolutely decimating this shanty town with the Shellophant. This guy is actually kind of rare. I can't think of many other levels that he appears in. But regardless, it's always fun smashing stuff despite whatever awkward message this level is trying to poison our youth with. Alright, time for level number 69, the lab from Crash Bandicoot. Nice. As the final level of the game, it's nothing too spectacular following a lot of the other places we've visited already. There are next to no boxes to break, or much of anything, aside from these timed switch puzzles. I mostly just feel bad for the employees of Cortex Castle who have to navigate this place on a regular basis. Everything is electrified and the floor just does as it pleases. This level might have made a slightly higher position in the rankings if it wasn't for the Insane Trilogy forcing the bonus round into the requirement for gem completion. That fucking box that's hidden off screen, Christ almighty, most people probably never even knew it existed in the original, making it quite a tough pill to swallow. Following the lab is a very similar level design wise. It's a familiar hallway stage inside of an industrial base, but here it's more dynamic with some side scrolling, more monkey bars which are slightly less painful than usual by this game standards, along with a few cool points of interest unique to this area alone. It's also one of the few levels that features an invisibility crate. A very strange addition, but it makes the level much more memorable thanks to its inclusion. However, the music for Weathering Heights may just be the highlight. Jungle Rumble gets a bad rap by a lot of people. Sure, the Jeep controls are funky, we've already covered that, but everything else here is decently thought out. It may not be well presented with the depressing visuals, but the environment has several nice points of interest. It does also include a bonus stage which requires the bullshit tiptoe ability, but the chase sequence is still fun and has its place. 
The one consistency Crash Bandicoot has throughout the entire series is strong jungle levels. Even if the games are terrible, I don't know if you've noticed, but the jungle themed areas are usually some of the best. And that's no different for the Game Boy Advance. The design and music is familiar and fantastic, and the structure of these levels is really good, to no one's surprise. What can be said other than that? These levels speak for themselves as solid platforming stages and magically transform the great gameplay we love onto this portable device. The Temple of Zoom appears early on into Titans, but is actually one of the more enjoyable levels of the entire game. It consists of a few different rooms with some trials in each, various surfing areas, and the entire thing is capped off with a battle against Cortex and the Yuctopus. It's not a great fight by any means, but it's definitely against one of the more visually striking opponents we meet on our journey. Temple locations are another that Crash just always seems to nail expertly. Alright, the final entry from Mind Over Mutant. Womper Island. Serving as the most central point for the game, it's the largest and most diverse location featuring jungles, temples, ruins, windy cliffs, subterranean crawl spaces, and even a haunted cathedral. There is so much to do on this map and everything feels so alive. We have a boss fight against Evil Coco, which is a terrible fight, I'll admit, but easy to forget when you go up against the Spike and Grimly Champions. Looking back over some of the other locations from the game, a lot of them feel quite restrictive and even soulless in places, but this main area is the complete opposite. So I'm glad the game was able to make it this far up the list after some big hits early on. Now, this level we could talk about all day, as it's easily one of the most memorable levels of the entire franchise. We've got Dr. Neo Cortex in drag, so it must be Jungle Bungle from Crash Twin Sanity. This is such a fun level, even all these years later. Just oozing with personality and so many great, hilarious and classic quotable moments. It just sets the tone perfectly for the entire game. And the actual level itself, while a very basic tutorial stage, includes some fun gem challenges along the way through this interesting woodland path. But the icing on the cake is the reveal of Cortex at the end, which is followed by a decent battle. The first phase is a neat throwback to Cortex's original boss from the first game, but then Mecha Bandicoot crashes the party to some of the most kicking fight music ever created. This is a fucking level, which means we've reached that glorious point of the video when I can finally proclaim that from here on out, everything we'll be looking at is the reason Crash Bandicoot fans are Crash Bandicoot fans. Cortex Power is one of the few totally unique levels from the first game, highlighted with a quick little introduction before it begins. It also stands out as the only level in the game that's played from a top-down perspective, I guess to help with the navigation through these snaking hallways. It's a level that needs to be played almost back to front at times if you want to snag that gem. Very different playing through this because there really isn't any other level like it. Back into the atmosphere for Eskimo Roll. This map features a lot of pits and other places you can fall off, along with all of the henchmen blocking your path. They do a pretty pathetic job of doing that, but still, it's the thought that counts, right? The part of this level I always enjoyed was reaching the end and getting to boost through these giant tubes. The only detail this level got wrong though, is that Crash doesn't pick up snow as he rolls around and grow bigger and bigger like a snowball. Quite the missed opportunity for something truly memorable, but this map still stands out among the sea of awful vehicle stages. Speaking of which, oh Jesus Christ, have mercy on us all. It was only some 100 levels ago we started this entire thing talking about this damn minecart. But in Compactor Reactor, it's actually not that bad. 
The level design is much more interesting, and while it's still quite shitty, thankfully, it's not long before we're on foot running through the underground base. The rest of this level looks quite familiar to some of the previous stages we've seen, but the music this time around gives it a lot more energy. It may be a little short, but I'm glad it doesn't overstay its welcome either. Back to Twin Sanity's 10th Dimension, Rockslide Rumble sees Crash and Evil Crash showing off their mad SSX skills riding on top of the Cortexes. Riding the Cortexes? Does Crash like to ride Cortex, does he? Okay, moving on. The music here is like a humming, mumbled rock song, and the level itself is badass looking. This is the second appearance for this type of level in the game, however, and we all know that nothing can beat the original. Rock Slide Rumble even copy and paste the same introduction cutscene from Slip Slide Ice Capades earlier on in the game. While very similar, this level did the entire thing much better. Visually, it's a lot easier to look at, the level is a bit more dynamic with the presentation, every single gem has an interesting obstacle to bypass in order to collect them, but it also includes some of the most memorable lines of the entire franchise. It's always fun to slide through here to grab the crystal at the expense of some gems. In at number 57, we've got the motorbike levels from Warped. While some of these can be a little frustrating due to poor layout in certain sections, it'll never detract from the stylized theme, music, and feel of racing through the desert on Crash's favourite hog. Sorry little fella, but there is a new favourite in town. Personally, I'd have to say the orange asphalt sunset variation is the best of the pack, though I am also a fan of Area 51. It's got an eerie presence to it, and the pitch black adds some extra challenge where it's needed. And like a lot of the stages we're starting to see now, it's hard to argue the iconic imagery that has defined Crash as a household name. The entranced volcano levels are some solid 2D platforming. There always seems to be some kind of hazard you need to work alongside in order to get by, be it fireballs shooting up from the lava or the copter pack later on, but it never feels frustrating as a result. The levels look amazing too, and the music, probably the best Game Boy Crash Bandicoot music there is honestly. Hell, it holds its own against some of the console music and gameplay, so job well done on this one. It says a lot when a weak portable can stand tall against console games. Now this is a Crash Bandicoot level, the jungle roller stages from the original game. This is where it started people, our introduction to the style and atmosphere that would shape our favourite games. Here we met our first TNT crate, played our first bonus stage, and experienced our first gem secrets. Seriously, what more do you want out of me on this one? The music is so peaceful and matches the visuals perfectly, creating an image that's become synonymous with the PlayStation brand and this character. And you know, it's funny to me, with the experience of age, how unanimously feared this image is, despite it really being a pretty simple trick, which just goes to show that the little things can go a long way. The daytime here is beautiful, but the haunting interiors of nighttime just rank a little higher on the list. This level has Coco running through a gauntlet of medieval mayhem, accompanied by a firefly to help navigate towards the end. And gauntlet is the perfect term to describe this level, because the entire stage is actually a clone of the gauntlet, featured earlier on in the game playing as Crash. Of course, certain obstacles have been switched around a little, but this is still a copy and paste job. The music in Nighttime is much better, but Coco lacks most of the advanced control we get with Crash, so the gauntlet just beats it by a hair. Still, the design of this castle is neat, with various memorable sections, and as for the gameplay, this is easily one of the better designed stages of the entire game. And it's also a well-executed throwback to the classic castle levels of the original Crash Bandicoot. 
speaking of which, we're back to the original with the boulder chase levels. Even more iconic than the standard jungle stages we were just gushing over a moment ago. What makes these levels for me is the atmosphere. Even though the layout of hazards is incredibly basic, the thumping, booming drum track represents Crash's and your own heartbeat perfectly as he does his best Indiana Jones impression. And I mean, come on, if we're still talking about these levels today, they must be some of the best. Man, we've looked at so many of these already, I'm starting to get deja vu here. Lights Out and Fumbling in the Dark have some real creepy vibes going on. Sneaking through Cortex Castle is a nerve-wracking experience, and finding yourself stuck in the pitch black void is intimidating to say the least. All you do here is run forward and jump, without much of anything else really happening, but sometimes, the most basic ideas executed well can impress and inspire moving forward. Which is exactly what happened with this type of level. And even if you do find yourself in the pitch black, that doesn't always mean that you'll be left in the dark. And here we are at the number 50 spot. <laughs> I honestly thought that we'd never make it this far, but thankfully, the quality of levels took a sharp turn upwards at the halfway mark. So, let's keep the lights on and take a look at level number 50. The Firefly levels from Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back finally making its appearance in the rankings, just in time for the top 50 Crash Bandicoot levels. And what a fantastic entry point, the peak of the franchise's Lights Out levels. Night Fight and Totally Fly take the previously established format and perfect it in every possible way. The levels are much more dynamic with more interesting hazards and combination of hazards. Bonus stages need to be run in unison with your light source so you don't get left behind. And the addition of a split path is a cruel but perfectly constructed challenge for a level this late into the final warp room. It's this stark contrast in mood within a level that sets it apart from all of the others. And back to Wrath of Cortex. Man, this game is going the distance. Though it is at an advantage with the largest level count of the entire franchise, it started the rankings off at 163. Now we're within the top 50 and still not done with it. Anyway, Bamboozled is the first of the Atmosphere levels, taking place through a roller coaster of organic tubes, which are great for building up a lot of natural speed, and given this is the first of these stages in the game, there are a lot less cheap, poorly designed areas, so the level manages to be more enjoyable than most. Similarly, Cavern Catastrophe from Crash to Insanity is another roller coaster like level. After we destroy Mecha Bandicoot, Cortex loses his cool and attacks Crash, triggering the roller brawl section of the stage. We shoot down mine shafts, launch over pits of acid, and slowly navigate the various elevators and other mechanisms, finally landing in a clearing down below. The duo finds a crystal right before this giant drill filled with ant people enter the scene, and after disposing of them, Crash and Cortex have to work together to escape. It's not just a roller coaster by design, the story beats and emotions we run through during the course of this map are amazing. All of this makes for an incredible location in the world of Crash that's both memorable and highly replayable. The space levels in the huge adventure on Game Boy Advance combine the best elements from both Crash 2's space levels and Crash 3's future levels to create some incredibly addicting and unforgettable side-scrolling gameplay. The only thing that lets these stages down is a lack of foresight in certain spots, but it doesn't ruin them by any means. Playing through these areas is still lots of fun, and the visuals and music only complement that. And hell, we can't forget the hidden gem path where you get to ride Crash's hover bike through space. How cool is that? Unfortunately, Coco doesn't get a hover bike, but her jet ski is a good substitute. 
The pirate levels from Crash 3 Warped are quite important looking back across the entire series, with many great set pieces like the ships firing cannonballs, the big island shaped like Cortex's skull, and that one spot where you can actually get out of bounds to find some extra lives. But the music in these levels is easily one of the best tracks to come out of Warped. It's just so bouncy and vibrant, like the visuals which are also to die for. Very solid vehicles stages that I know some aren't going to agree with me, but that's okay because you can't deny that childhood nostalgia of seeing this for the first time. From the ocean to the beach, the Bandicoot has washed ashore ready for a lifetime of adventure. Insanity Beach serves as the introduction of Crash across multiple generations. It's a brief level, but still manages to cram many points of interest into its hallway design. Climbing up these ruins, getting that third Aku Aku crate and becoming invincible just before that split path with the Bridge of Crates. But incredibly rare for the franchise, this is one of the few levels that gets two different music tracks. The iconic exterior beach music, but also the much more subdued sounds of the jungle interior. For such a generic stage in the grand scheme of things, it still manages to stand out amongst the rest and pioneer a magnificent legacy. On to another classic that helped to build the series' foundation, the upstream levels. This is such a calming environment with the lush flora and fauna populating the riverbank, hopping across the lily pads to the sweet xylophone chimes makes for a nice change of pace against some of the more heart-jolting areas of the game. And aside from some of the unique hazards we don't see anywhere else, there really isn't much more to it. These are just some nice, super chill locations. Bonsai Bonsai from Wrath of Cortex is also all of those things. This was the first time we ever truly got the chance to play as Coco platforming through a level, and this is a solid level to introduce her. Starting low down by the rivers and ponds, working your way through the various shacks and temples, up towards the rooftops. It's another one of those incredibly dynamic levels with forward movement, side scrolling, and even a top down section. I don't really know what that's about, but it gives this place a unique identity as one of the better levels Wrath of Cortex has to offer. I bet you'd almost forgotten about Crash of the Titans, but it's still here. However, these next three levels are all so similar, we're just going to run through them all right now. Number 42 is the Family Tree. The overall design of this place has some wicked voodoo vibes. The premise is that it's a big tree. How exciting. But tell me, is this the same tree we see back here in the first game? I've always thought so. Regardless, this place has some serious personality to its creepy design, especially once you get inside and climb this giant rib cage into a skull where we fight a bunch of battlers. But I think it's the constant climbing up and up this thing that really makes it. Part 2 of this area takes place entirely inside of the tree, with a lot of slides and mushrooms to jump around on. Everything is lush green, coated in moss and fungi, and it just feels like a very natural location to visit. And then we come back outside for timber trials, as we continue to climb higher and higher up through this map. But for the majority of the level, we can see a house off in the distance out on the edge of a gnarled up tree branch. This gets back to that old idea of making you feel like you're going somewhere, which culminates with us actually making our way over to the house. This is where we find level 155, Adult Edumacation, which is a shame that such a well thought out and noteworthy area could come to such a disappointing end. Well, Crash of the Titans has had a good run, making it into the top 40 levels, but its time is unfortunately over. Level 39 is Shock and Awesome, the final Titans level we have to rank. Taking place in Engine's industrial space, littered with ratsicles and a rhino roller segment through an office complex, it is much like a lot of the other levels from this game, but the location and fun you can have smashing this joint up make it a memorable time. 
Honestly, how could you go wrong with smashing shit on top of giant monsters while engine babbles on and on over the PA system? It's a solid end to Titan's run in this video, but we've still got plenty of other games left in the race, so let's keep crashing through them. Arctic Antics is the first level of Wrath of Cortex, which might be why a lot of people have a negative association with it, given the mixed feelings among fans for this game. But honestly, the level is actually pretty good. It's got some neat landmarks and split paths, the presentation visually and audibly is nice, and while it is quite easy, it's also the introductory level, so what do you expect? It's hard to really comment on this one, given the simplicity, but the layout and general structure is great, so this one could be considered underrated by a lot of people. Up next we have the B levels from Cortex Strikes Back. These are a bit of an oddity, I'm going to be honest, and they include a lot of unique stuff that we don't see anywhere else in the game or even throughout the series. These spitting plants, the creepy moving idols that don't really do anything, and then of course you've got all the killer bees. Crash can even go underground to avoid them. That's an actual thing bandicoots do, and we wouldn't see this again until Mind Over Mutant. That's crazy! But the B levels also have some of the more noteworthy secrets of the game as well. As if the split death route wasn't tricky enough, but then you've got this dude hanging out over here you can slam and then warp into a hidden area. Then on top of that is also the famous nitro staircase that leads to the purple gem. These levels are something else, holy shit. Weird, but filled with lots of detail and expert design. Fahrenheit Frenzy is one of the most quality levels Wrath of Cortex has to offer. Starting off with a fairly decent copter pack section through the fiery industrial tunnels that lead into this secret base. Everything here is simply just a fire variant of many previous secret base levels in the game, but that's not a bad thing. Fire is the coolest element after all, and these laboratory courses have all been top quality. Of note, this level has a sweet x-ray area, and that invisibility crate is back again. But the environment here just looks startling and intimidating with all of the fire, which is accompanied by one of the best music tracks in all of Crash Bandicoot. Alright, we're back to Twin Sanity's Academy of Evil. This time we're running through the classrooms, avoiding hall monitors and getting into trouble against the chaotic experiments. God, this place is amazing. Especially the frantic climb to escape a rising pool of acid that's destroying the library. That's such a great set piece. But more interesting is that this is the first time we properly get to play a level as Cortex. He showed up for a quick tutorial earlier, but this is is an actual level, with a chase scene running away from killer insects and using his gun to move various platforms or trigger events. Granted, Cortex's gameplay does somewhat tarnish the experience given the more limited structure of his abilities, but the overall level is just prime crash gameplay with a new twist. And I mean, come on! Playing as Cortex? How can you not love it? Classroom Chaos is of course followed up with Rooftop Rampage, where we get to play as Nina Cortex in her debut game. Her gameplay is a lot more free-flowing, and with a bigger emphasis on platforming thanks to Nina's extendable arms. Strangely, we never saw this from Nina again following to Insanity, and it's a shame because this level keeps a strong pace. But just look at this location we're running through. There is a magical aura of mystery to this place, mixed in with some rebellion jumping all around, busting chimneys and ringing the bells. All to an absolutely killer rock song. 
Towards the end of this escape from the school, Nina narrowly avoids death from a school bus suspended from an airship, and finally, Cortex comes back in for a boss fight against Madame Amberly herself. This fight is a seriously underrated battle from the series, with another really awesome piece of music to go along with it, though you never really get to hear much of it amongst everything going on here. But this level and classroom chaos showcase the zany personality of Twin Sanity to pure perfection. Crash 3's underwater levels are a rare showcase of just how good underwater levels can be when done correctly. Deep trouble and under pressure accurately portray what it feels like to move through water and yet still manage to be fun, entertaining and cartoony in design. I don't exactly know what period in time these levels are supposed to take place in, given the entire point of this game is time travel, but it's easy to forget and ignore when you're swimming through these reefs in search of crystals and gems. It's just another example of taking a simple concept that most fail to execute and absolutely nailing. Now let's warp to the final spot on the list for Entranced on Game Boy Advance. Man, these portable games are actually incredibly solid for what they are, and the Egyptian themed levels display that with a one to one recreation of the same stages from Crash 3. Every enemy, every type of hazard or landmark is present here, and for a GBA title, everything is incredibly detailed as well. Every pixel has a purpose within the scenery here. It still blows me away just how great these are to play through, even downgraded from the originals they are inspired from. If you haven't played this game before, then what are you doing? Get on it because it's arguably the best post-Naughty Dog Crash game out there. Well, before these new remakes came along anyway. In similar fashion, the Stone Age levels in Warped are also incredibly detailed, even back on the PS1. The colours used to convey this Jurassic time period just work a treat along with the music in building that realistic world. Just compare this to Tyrannosaurus Rex from Tag Team Racing. One is cartoony and the other makes you nervous about what's around the next corner. But what I always found interesting is that for a chase level, the chase with the dinosaur is generally the less interesting aspect of the overall stage. The entire thing is structured like a snake, weaving between different paths, going from side-scrolling and forwards and backwards directions. However, Crash moving into the screen always had a stronger focus on hazard and even gameplay variety once you find that baby dino. Excellent levels, let's leave it at that. Next up are the pits from Crash 2. Both this level and Turtle Woods serve as Crash 2's generic jungle stages. And they are whopper jungle stages. What did you expect at this point? I always hear people bitching about the split paths in the pits, but that's what makes this such an interesting map. Not knowing which route to take when you first move through here, and having to backtrack to collect everything, gives this an added feeling of exploration weak in most other levels. And as for Turtle Woods, the first level of the entire game, and my personal first Crash Bandicoot level ever, has some of the more interesting secrets of Cortex Strikes Back. Small details you otherwise wouldn't notice give you a feeling of accomplishment when you finally figure them out. Wonderful, classic Crash design at its finest. But I mean, come on. If we're talking classic Crash, then the Great Gate and Native Fortress levels from the original game absolutely need a mention. As far as structured gameplay is concerned, both of these actually fit contextually within their environment. Every element here has a purpose, meaning this doesn't feel like we're playing a game. Everything makes sense. The island natives have covered the walls in traps for protection, while the local critters that inhabit the jungle are trying to make their way inside. 
And sure, these spinning platforms can be a pain in the ass if you're a nine-year-old square-eyed Jack playing this for the first time, but despite that, these levels are an iconic landmark for both this series and for sensible, smart level design. Which brings us to the final level for the huge adventure, the Snowy Caverns. Possibly the most dynamic handheld crash levels there are, moving into a 3D chase sequence with Polar and then back into the side-scrolling gameplay. Both parts of this actually offer a decent level of challenge. Ice physics are well done for a GBA game, everything from Crash 2 is here and still works just as well, so these are definitely some quality action. But that ends the run for not just this game, but all of the portable crash experiences. We're into the top 30 now, and there aren't many games left in the running. So we can expect to see some serious contenders starting to get knocked out of this thing. Given we're in the home stretch now, remember to like and share this video if you've enjoyed it so far, and maybe even consider subscribing if you think I've earned it. Okay, now that that's done, let's continue on with another snow level for number 27. Ice Climb from Twin Sanity. This is a very lengthy map with a lot happening. It starts off with a vertical stretch amongst mechanical platforms and killer penguins to find Cortex. Advancing together, Crash launches Neo all over the place to collect gems and activate switches, when finally, the two stumble across Uka Uka encased in the frozen walls. It's quite the adventure, that's for sure. The fight at the end doesn't pose much of a threat, but the music here is badass, so I'll forgive it. This heavy platform, cooperative level style is the reason so many people remember this game so fondly. It's definitely something not too many games have attempted and executed this fluently. Time for more boulder chase levels, this time from Crash 2. These are the pinnacle of chase levels throughout the entire franchise. They took everything that was great about the originals, dialed it up with some more interesting hazards and combination of those hazards, but managed to hold on to that fear factor with the booming music and intimidating visuals. What can be said about these levels? They're totally awesome. And yet, they were still trumped by unbearable. I used it as an example at the top. Unique levels that separate themselves from the rest will be worthy for their own spot on the list. And what a better example of that than this. Not only does Unbearable swap out the generic boulder for this crazy polar bear, starting a trend that continued throughout all of the chase levels to come through the series, but it also combines later on in the level a gameplay mechanic from a different set of stages to make some kind of adrenaline fueled hybrid section that is just unlike anything else in the series. I'll never forget the first time I played through this as a kid. My eyes lit up when I realised the limitless potential for gameplay here. And I need to mention, of course, the hidden death route. Such a subtle hint that, again, just opened my eyes and mind for everything I'd ever play after this. And that just might be the reason why this is my personal number one level for the series. But we're only at number 25, so there is still plenty more to come. The medieval levels of Warped were less about platforming or challenge, instead featuring a bigger emphasis on world building and just having a bit of fun. And the setting is perfect for that. From blasting chickens with a bazooka, frogs turning into princes, and these double-header guys, for a generally weak level theme from a gameplay perspective, it sure is an incredibly memorable and enjoyable one despite that. And like a lot of the levels we're seeing at this point, it's just far too iconic to be any lower down the list. Okay, well now we've got the generator room. 
one of the few totally unique areas of the original Crash Bandicoot, and one of the few only fear-inducing stages that we've seen. This place is something else. I don't think there is another location in all of Crash that is this thematically striking or intimidating to explore. The pitch black basement with that droning, freaky music in the background. Is this Crash Bandicoot or Silent Hill for fuck's sake? Because that's exactly the vibe it gives off. The layout of platforms and pathways also make each jump nerve-wracking to take on. This level would have appeared higher in the rankings had it not lost a lot of its character in the Insane Trilogy version. Don't get me wrong, the level is still really good, but it's not great here. The aging, rustic visual style of the PS1 graphics is really what completes the feel of this place. A constant feeling of dread. Switching gears now, let's take a look at Totem Hokum, one of Twin Sanity's bigger levels. Phase 1 has Crash leading a blind cortex through a barrage of crazy hazards that block his path. We haven't actually seen this since Bandicoot Pursuit, way back at number 76. But while this is all that level had going for it, Totem Hokum is only just starting. Phase 2 is the river section with these tribal snipers watching your every move. We've gone from Silent Hill horror straight into Metal Gear Solid stealth action here. This part can actually be a trick to get through at times, but is followed up with this beach to play around in before the final phase inside of the tribal village. It's weird coming back here after all of these years since the original game, getting to mess about and find Papu Papu's hut. And after a quick chase, we're up to the Tiki Mon boss fight. Now technically, this takes place within the Insanity Beach area, but it's such a fun fight that it deserves a mention this high on the list. Totem Hokum, again, is part of the reason so many people look back on Twinsanity with such strong nostalgic memories. A whopper level that both tributes and evolves one of the most prominent locations of Crash's world. In at 21, we've got Solar Bowler from Wrath of Cortex. Of all of the vehicle stages in this game, none of them compare to the feeling you get playing this. Out on the edge of space, rolling along these narrow walkways, down slides and by all of the platforms without a single barrier preventing you from falling off the edge. It's a mesmerising stage for certain, visually engaging as well, with some amazing music to accompany the precarious level design. Wrath of Cortex has been our distant player for the entire rankings, kicking things off with the worst Crash Bandicoot level. Yet here it stands within the top 20. Level 20 is of course Crash and Burn, the final level we've got from Wrath today. And what a level. Great music, great location, and the course itself is such a blast to play through. You've got the mineshaft, all of the lava platforms to hop across, but I always loved how the bonus stage takes you away from the main area to get a good look at the island and that volcano. It might not be the most challenging level in the game, but it still has a very strong selection of hazards and enemies to avoid. A very strong end to Wrath of Cortex's run through these rankings, and a very strong crash level that's always great to revisit. But now that we're into the top 20, shit's about to start getting real close. So strap in and strap on. Level 19 is the High Road and Road to Nowhere. Obviously I mentioned Challenge in the previous spot. Well, have you played the High Road in the Insane Trilogy? God, what a bastard stage this is to complete. So don't even get me started on the Relic. But even despite the many years of frustration we've all experienced with these levels over the years, we still keep coming back to them, because for all of their simplistic design, they give us a decent challenge and a wonderfully mysterious location to explore. They manage to be threatening in a similar way to the generator room with just how empty and cold it feels. Not to mention, it's just so easy to slip through the gaps on this bridge. But it's levels like this that make us better at games, by forcing us to grow and learn. 
Also, fuck the high road relic in Ensane. Seriously, can we all agree with that? Time for a trip to China for Coco and Pura's levels. Both Orient Express and Midnight Run are fantastic vehicle stages. It's such a great location for a time traveling game as well, and the environment, old or new, feels like you're actually there with all of the minute details. The music is bouncy and energetic, which matches the gameplay for some amazing action, much like many of Coco's stages in this game. It's just a shame we only got two of these levels, while the stiffer, less interesting motorbike stages appeared four times. As much as I still love them, that is a criminal decision if you ask me, because these levels are so awesome to play through. Back to Twin Sanity for Ant Agony. This is the final stretch of the game, and it's basically one big platforming collectathon gauntlet. And it's all top quality stuff. Despite being a cold underground factory, the energy is warm and lively with some sweet visuals and challenge in certain areas. And of course, it's concluded with the final boss of the game, where we get to play as all three characters. While there are an infinite number of better boss fights I could name from the other games, by the standards of Crash Bandicoot final bosses, this is top tier. The music is heavy and really packs a punch, serving as a strong end to an otherwise muddled game. Ant Agony is a fantastic level, but it's not the best level of Twin Sanity. <laughs> That title goes to High Seas, High Jinx. This takes place on Engine's battleship, which is armed with tons and tons of missiles. The entire scene with these things launching out around you as Crash tries his best to navigate the mess of platforms makes such a bold statement. There is also the Engine Room, which offers a very unique, realistic concept adapted into gameplay, which is always nice to see. The music is fun and and once we escape the ship, we get to have a simple but memorable fight against the man himself. But like a lot of the levels in this game, that's only phase one. Immediately after this victory, we have a chase sequence against Rusty Walrus where the challenge and atmosphere continues to grow out of control. Then the third and final phase is a much better boss fight against both Enbrio and Entropy, where the storyline of this entire stage reaches its peak. I've said it throughout the entire video now, dynamic levels like this one that constantly change around you as you play through them always offered some of the much more iconic and entertaining moments throughout this series. And this one is no different. Unfortunately, that is the final Twin Sanity level in the rankings, but making it to number 16 is nothing to downplay. But that means we've only got three games left in the running, so let's do this. Get ready for number 15, the Jetboard River stages from Crash Bandicoot 2. Now these are badass. I mean, they combine the standard Crash formula with a fun vehicle and somehow manage to find the perfect balance between them. The music is surf rock style and the upgraded design next to Crash 1's river levels expands on the depth of this world. Gem challenges with the timer are also a neat idea, exclusive to these levels, and they're just overall solid on every front. Let's stay with Crash 2 and look at another vehicle level, a staple of the entire series, the Jetpack. I've got to start off with the music. Not since Aquatic Ambience or Sticker Brush Symphony in the Donkey Kong Country series had we ever heard such a majestic, flowing music in our platformers. And sure, this technically isn't a platforming level, but you know what I mean. 
The entire design of Rocket and Pack Attack's environments is breathtaking to say the least. Floating through this space station, looking out into the vast emptiness of our universe. Luckily for us, these corridors are anything but empty, which makes for some incredibly enjoyable and oftentimes challenging gameplay to sink your teeth into. And like a lot of the stuff we're starting to see this late into the rankings, there really isn't anything else like this through the rest of the series. Crash's jetpack was often duplicated, but its glory was never truly repeated. But now, I think we might have the pinnacle of all Crash Bandicoot vehicular gameplay with Polar. Here we've got three levels, all of them incredibly simplistic in concept and design, yet they've all been nailed to absolute perfection. There is balance with control, level design, atmosphere and challenge. Nothing is too extreme, too easy or too mundane. But everything about these courses is awesome. It's a shame that the series, and therefore this list, has had to be filled with so many poorly executed nightmare vehicle stages, all trying to replicate the lightning in a bottle Crash 2 has just displayed here. Polar is just the best, and he dispenses free lives, so you can't argue with that. What's that about free lives? I guess I'd better hit up Castle Machinery before we go into Slippery Climb and Stormy Ascent. Holy shit. Slippery Climb was the bane of many people's existence trying to play through the original Crash Bandicoot. The level has a threatening grunge to it with music and platforming that puts you on the edge of your seat. This is platforming challenge, old school style, with only a single checkpoint dead in the middle. It's crazy to think that there was actually a more sadistic variation of this place that never truly saw the light of day until the Insane Trilogy. Say what you want about the difficulty and your own experiences, but that's what makes both of these stages so good. The challenge feels impossible at times, but it isn't. The biggest argument against any of these Crash games is the somewhat undemanding difficulty. So that feeling of satisfaction you get from completing these is truly like nothing else Crash Bandicoot has to offer. Oh my, the ruined levels in Cortex Strikes Back perfectly showcase what I personally love about this game dynamic and fun level structure that has this strange feeling of uncertainty surrounding it. Ruination in particular gave me a lot of trouble when I first played this game as a kid with those bizarre, awkwardly rotating platforms. But in retrospect, it was an element unlike any other in the game. These ruin stages also had a great, eerie aesthetic going on which was enhanced by the dated graphics. But the music kept things cheap and adventurous despite all of that, which resulted in a well-rounded, solid experience, well deserving of such a high rank. But, you must realise what this means. We only have 10 more levels to get through. Oh, what a fantastic journey this has been, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. We can finally see the light at the end of this long, long tunnel, which means it's finally time for me to say, Here are your top 10 Crash Bandicoot levels. In at number 10, we've got the Egyptian levels from Crash 3 Warped. This is one of the few levels in the series that gives off a strong feeling of claustrophobia through its hallways. Even some levels that should feel the same way just don't achieve it as well as these pyramid platformers. It's an environment ripe with interesting mechanics from the various switches, mummies and darts shooting out of walls. It really borrows from all of those classic adventure attractions tropes that heavily inspired the character. I was debating on whether or not Tomb Raider was eligible for its own spot on the list, given the drastic change in pacing of the level compared to the rest, but yeah, I don't feel like there is enough different about it. But despite that, all of these levels have a killer mood to them, enhanced by a strong attention for detail.
Number 9, Crash 2 Sewer Levels. God, it was all the way back at 120 that we saw the Game Boy Advance recreation of these. That's a crazy divide in quality, but it's hard to replicate the magic of this place. Well, as magical as a sewer can be anyway. Everything I just said about the Egyptian levels can also be applied to this as well, with that same claustrophobic atmosphere and the amazing selection of different hazards. Where the sewers just barely get the one up, however, is the general vibrancy of the entire thing. Everything is a lot more bouncy with a consistent pace. Even the monkey bars don't slow you down, which is great to see. Still though, it's such a close race at this point that it doesn't even really matter. It's all been really good for a while now, and these top 10 positions could be placed in any order. But the sewer levels manage to stand out and fit in with a lot of the different stage themes we've seen throughout the series. And unlike the Egyptian stages, everything here is amazing beyond the confines of exploring a musty sewer. On to the Jaws of Darkness, Crash Bandicoot's temple ruins hidden deep underground. Holy shit, this place is creepy. If not for the nightmarish void of black that follows you through the entire stage, then it's the labyrinth-like design with platforms everywhere, narrow corridors that smash crash, and the few creatures that populate the area. These levels offer both time-tested challenge with dynamic pathways and quality world building filled with all sorts of details otherwise non-existent in this place. And of course, the lighting and music play a tremendous role in creating that chilling and exciting feeling you get while hunting for boxes. Now, let's warp from the darkness into what I hope is Crash's bright and exciting future. Of course, you can't have a time travel gimmick without a cheeky peek forwards. It makes for a great setting to run around in, trying to collect the last remnants of a limited power source. These stages feature both a main stretch into the screen with interesting obstacles and box challenges before moving into a traditional side-scrolling gameplay with a bigger focus on pure platforming. The highly stylized future aesthetic is matched with a neat, funky little music track to complete the feel. Not the most challenging stages by any means, but very memorable nonetheless. So, it's no wonder why Vicarious Visions chose this level theme for a brand new stage in the Insane Trilogy. Yes, coming in at number 6, we've got Future Tense. What you're looking at here is the first original Crash Bandicoot level in over 10 years. And it just so happens to be for the remake of a game that was released 20 years prior. That is something monumental and makes this level unique from the other futuristic levels on this list, if only for that reason. But playing through this for the first time is also what inspired me to make this crazy ranking to begin with. You wouldn't have had this video if it wasn't for such an awesome stage. I said it at the start, despite the series absence for over a decade, those 20 years of the Bandicoot are an era of their own. And Future Tense is the beginning of a new era, mixed in with the old guard. And that's why this moment, right now, is the ideal opportunity to tribute that previous era. But what makes this level so amazing, ignoring all of that, is that it's just an awesome level and the best of the futuristic levels seen in Warped. I said that they lack a level of serious challenge. Well, Future Tense has that covered without a doubt. The platforming is top notch and the structure of patterns and new hazards give it a life of its own. And it's designed around all of the unlockable abilities in Crash 3, unlike many of the other levels we've already discussed. The release of Future Tense is a landmark moment for the Crash Bandicoot franchise and serves as proof that this marsupial's future is brighter than ever. In at number 5, The Lost City and Sunset Vista. 
What can be said about these levels that hasn't already been said at this point? It's another strong side-scrolling setup, with challenge maybe not as daunting as Slippery Climb for example, but it can still be a pain in the ass if it feels like it. But it's another level to overcome, and that's something that makes it stand out from the crowd. Visually, the colours and contrast used in this area of the game are distinctive, and it's mixed in with some fantastically detailed set pieces like the riverbed and the vertical wall segments. But then you've also got that dramatic, booming tune in there as well. It gets your heart rate up nice and good while you're trying your best to stay cool, getting by all of these wild contraptions. This series was built on that old school platforming mentality, and The Lost City is a great example of that. But it's not the greatest example of that. It's time for a knockout blow here. The final level for the original game. Say what you want about its difficulty, simplicity and lack of polish in certain areas, this is the game that started it all and set the standard for everything that would follow. And as far as this game goes, heavy machinery and castle machinery deliver the best side-scrolling action. From all of the platforming, interesting enemies and various hazards, but also the abrupt tonal shift from jungles and ruins into an industrial wasteland. It all comes back to that age-old idea of making the player feel like they're actually going somewhere and making progress. In the Insane Trilogy remakes, these are also some of the most gorgeous stages, even with the rustic machine design. But all of that aside, at its core, these are simply some solid levels with a pure focus. Crash's greatest strength. This first game is still Whopper all of these years later, so I'm sad to see that we've run out of levels from this so close to the finish line. Time for the top three. What's even left at this point? Next on the list, we have the space station levels from Crash 2's Final Warp Room. The previous levels may have been the best side-scrolling action the original game had to offer, but Piston It Away and Spaced Out are the peak for this entire series, without a doubt. Thematically, they've got the coolest industrial look and sound, but gameplay and level structure is on such a technical level above the rest. Combinations of Crash's moves wouldn't be this good again until Future Tense 20 years later. But here in Crash 2, all you've got are those basic moves. Spinning, sliding, and of course, jumping. That's it. So have fun backtracking through the mess of shrink rays and other obstacles to get that last gem, because these levels are a test of everything you've learned. Oh boy, this is such a difficult decision, but number two goes to the Arabian Towns in Warped. This is dynamic level design. Constantly switching between moving into the screen, to side-scrolling, up onto monkey bars, which are actually a lot of fun, back down to ground level, and then onto a vertical climb section, mixed in with all of these great platforming areas. It's what the Bandicoot has always excelled at. Design-wise, these towns are packed, absolutely full and vibrant the entire way through, and with help from the music, gives it a realistic quality unlike most of what we've seen. Between the daytime and nighttime, not that it matters, but I always personally preferred the day setting, you can just see everything a lot clearer, but the lighting at night more than makes up for that. Despite being cool up here on the rooftops, you can see a sense of warmth rising up from the marketplaces and huts down below. Don't let the fact that these levels just barely missed out on the top spot take away from their amazing quality and great impact on the overall series. Because this is why Crash 3 Warped is so beloved to this day. But now that it's all said and done, we've finally reached the top spot. Have you been keeping track? Do you know what it is? It's finally time to take a look at the best Crash Bandicoot level. 
the number one spot goes to... The snow levels in Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back. This place has a serious sense of familiarity to it, as we've actually been through here in the previous game. Now it's just covered in snow, with a lighter, bouncier soundtrack to go along with it. But the meat of these levels takes place in the side-scrolling areas, which allows the platforming action to shine as best as it possibly can. But of course, what sets these levels apart from all of the others is the introduction of ice physics. Slippery floors that make Crash go all over the place. Unlike the monkey bars in the Arabian levels that feel somewhat isolated and separate to Crash's core abilities, these ice mechanics are actually another layer on top of the already solid gameplay. Yes, that is literally the only factor defining this number one position, as honestly, they could both go here. But this extension onto Crash's fun gameplay is what puts these levels over the line. But I hear you all saying, well, wait a minute, Jack. What about Cold Hard Crash? That level is really hard with some tricky bullshit, so how is it worthy of the top spot? Well, the answer to that question is actually quite simple. Because it's fun as fuck and actually challenges the player unlike anything else in this game. We can all agree that Crash 2 is far too easy. Hell, a lot of these Crash games are far too easy. But Cold Hard Crash as a level is actually a masterpiece. The truly difficult aspect is a side path for one, designed to offer up a higher level of difficulty once you've beaten the game and are now going back through for all of the gems. But the structure of it is what makes this great. It takes all of Crash's core abilities without any of the frills seen in the later games and builds on top of them with the ice physics. That's what a good level does. Constantly tests you on what you've learned up until that point, and Cold Hard Crash is the literal definition of that. And as for the rest of these snow levels, all of them are great fun to play through. They've all got their unique landmarks too, such as the red gem tees in Snow Go, Snow Biz introduces the jungle rollers from the original game, and of course, Cold Hard Crash has what might be the most memorable death route of the entire franchise. Like I said, it's such a close call between these two areas for the top spot, but thanks to the constant one-upping and creative expansion of level design in relation to Crash's limited moveset, I can't see any Crash level as classic as these that do their job without fault so far beyond our expectations. And that does it. We've taken a lengthy journey from the absolute worst all the way through 20 years of Crash Bandicoot to find the absolute best it has to offer. I don't think it's much of a shock that the numerous attempts to recapture the lightning in a bottle simply can't compare with that strong foundation the series was built on. But having said that, there were a lot of key players post Naughty Dog that survived well into the higher positions. And I think that just goes to show why we're all still fans of the Bandicoot all these years later. His unpredictability through a constant state of imagination and quality. And to close the chapter on this era of Crash Bandicoot, I cannot wait to see what the future holds. This video was so much fun to make and I hope you all liked it. This was such a massive job to do and I've been working on this for literal months at this point. So if you did enjoy the video, it would mean so much to me if you could share it with your friends and on social media. Make sure you leave a comment with some of your favourite and least favourite Crash Bandicoot levels. And if you think I've earned it today, then maybe consider subscribing and hitting the bell for more videos from me in the future. Huge thank you goes out to all of my friends who helped me with this, and a special thanks goes out to all of the amazing people who support this channel on Patreon for allowing me to continue making crazy videos like this one. So, until next time, 
I'm Square Eye Jack, and I hope you have a great fucking day. Thanks for watching. <laughs>